My name is Carson Bonick, and uh, I'm a managing director of quantitative research at Capital IQ. And it's my pleasure to moderate a panel that will be looking at some of the key issues and lessons of uh, the global financial crisis and how we move forward in, in the terms of asset allocation. And uh, before we start talking about those lessons learned and, and uh, how we approach the challenges going forward, uh, I'd like to introduce the esteemed panel. And uh, maybe I could just ask that we go down the line and everyone introduce themselves and we'll go from there. Great. Fair enough. Uh, my name is Ray Joseph. I'm the uh, Deputy CIO for the State of New Jersey. My name is Sebastian Chavaria. I am the Co-Head of Business Development for Highbridge Capital Management. And I'm Andrew Alford, a Senior Portfolio Manager in the Quantitative Investment Strategies Group at GSAM. We had another panelist uh, who was unable to make it. He got stranded at LaGuardia by uh, the Michael Hennessy from, from Morgan Creek. Ironically, we were just joking before the panel started that, that uh, he was the one who brought up the ideas of tail events, and, uh, and uh, yet he had his own unforeseen tail event happen. And, uh, so well, he's here with us in spirit. So as we get started, I think we'd like to start off talking first a bit about the lessons from the global financial crisis and how, how uh, they relate to asset allocation. Um, you know, Andrew, maybe we can start with you and talk about some of the main takeaways that you find that you've had from that, and um, maybe what were some of the blind spots you think from an asset allocation perspective that that uh, people suffered from? Well, I think you know one of the key uh, lessons, if you will, of the financial crisis was just the limitations of risk management. Uh, and in particular, I think there were three key problems. Uh, one is, first of all, tail events, as we were just joking. I mean, in the sense that there were lots of events that occurred that just simply shouldn't have occurred or people weren't expecting to occur. Those could have been related to credit. They could have been related to, uh, you know, the housing downturn or even the poor performance of quantitative factors in August of 2007. Uh, so that was one, one issue, is just, you know, the fact that tail events occurred with far greater, uh, you know, probability or frequency than anyone had anticipated. Uh, the second is the impact of leverage, and in particular high leverage, that people had sort of put on in those periods of complacency in 2005 and 2006. And of course, the impact of leverage was uh, as severe as it was in part because of those tail events. And then the third thing is the, uh, the, the correlations that sort of converged or approached one during the financial crisis, and people have talked about that earlier today, but during periods of financial stress, economic stress, it's often the case that correlations across asset classes, across regions, uh, converge towards one, and so you just don't get the diversification uh, that people were kind of hoping for or counting on. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, Sebastian Ray, if you guys had some yeah. thoughts on what you think are the, the blind spots, or would you agree? Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything. Um, said, but I think, I think correlations definitely among all the asset classes uh, took us all by surprise. And obviously, you know, today we run um, some of our books and we'll continue to run them at less leverage than, than historically we had run them. Particularly, you know, we had historically been known for running around a 30 to 35 percent allocation or multi-strat to converts. Uh, and we ran at a, you know, a, a higher leverage. And I think we've at that level than we'd ever go back to. Today we run into much lower leverage, and I think we were surprised by, you know, the amount of uh, correlation that some of the credit strategies and equity strategies had to each other. And obviously when you have employ more leverage and then liquidity is just sucked out of the market, uh, you get caught up in it very, very quickly. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that, you know, a lot of managers uh, had to contend with was the illiquidity or the mismatch between your underlying liquidity to investors and uh, uh, and and the asset classes that you were trading you were trading in uh, and obviously a lot of a lot of groups had to had to lock up capital uh, it was an unfortunate event for for a lot of investors um, in certain cases uh, it turned out to be the right thing to do uh, in others uh, not so much the case but I think uh, I think there was a clearly looking looking forward. Um, you know, there needs to be, you need to have the right liquidity constraints for the underlying assets that you're managing. Yeah. And that was a, yeah. I think, surprise. No, I, I would agree with those points. I think the inherent problem that a lot of pension plans or, or investor groups would have is also illiquid investments across your platform sometimes that you're not aware of become problematic. A lot of funds, whether they're hedge funds or private equity funds, started to drift and they would, if in my opinion, chase returns and decide that now we're going to take on this illiquid pocket and put it into your fund. Well, 
if you're a pension plan and you have 35 different hedge funds in your portfolio, how do you conceptualize and, and take into account as they increase this illiquid problem? And that expectation was not communicated very well. And I think at times that has been a, a bigger challenge for pension plans and larger investors because you need to understand those risks. And if you are not aware of those risks, you can't take them into account. Uh, at the end of the day, I think a lot of organizations are, are drilling into uh, risk management and trying to determine how to take care of this issue going forward. I wonder, we talked about this idea, um, you know, each of you, each of you have talked about essentially the idea that people weren't necessarily as diversified as they thought they were given the, the, the realized correlations that came through during this crisis. And, I, and I'm wondering, Michael, maybe from your perspective, as you, as you already had touched on it from the liquidity side, um, you know, do you think that uh, the definition, your definition, or your firm's definition of diversification has changed? Or are you really just more concentrating on questioning your assumptions uh, to, to the inputs of your, you know, diversification equation? Which Michael are you? Oh, wearing? sorry. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> yes. Sebastian, maybe you can uh, go through. Yeah, I think, uh, I think definitely um, that it's a, it's a diff in retrospect, I think we were, listen, listen there are not all strategies were correlated in 2008. Our stat, our book uh, did, did very well. Uh, we've always assumed that that was an uncorrelated asset class. Uh, we've been more surprised by its correlation to markets in 2010 uh, than in 2008. That has been a, a difficult asset class this year for us. Um, I think that, uh, you know, clearly, you know, diversification uh, is sort of thrown out the window when, again, when we talk about sort of correlations going to one in that, in that kind of book. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things in retrospect that we, that we look at is try and, 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 and look at, so we have a, a group now, a risk group, we have a 14 person risk group that tries to work with our PMs uh, and allow them to look at all the other esoteric risks that may be impacting their portfolio. Either it be uh, currency uh, impact that they may be having on an underlying stock that they're looking at, they look at 13F filings for, uh, for major competitors uh, and try and look at not only what the correlations are among just the book, but also the correlations we may have with other managers out there. And I think we all learned that, uh, quant managers learned that very clearly in August of 07, uh, that, you know, we, we may have a lot more correlation to other managers out there. And so, you know, it would be, it would be wrong of us not to, to have a group or a team trying to estimate what, what correlation we have, not only to, to our own asset classes, but to other uh, competitors out there. Um, but we're working a lot more with our PMs, and we have an entire team working on building internal systems uh, in the organization to try and look at um, different factors. Uh, looking back at performance over the last couple of months, um, for example, the last couple of months we've seen huge correlation uh, in our in our equity uh, books, and and just sort of looking at you know where did where did the where did the book go wrong? Was it stock picking? Was it factors that we didn't look at, um, you know, looking at real-time uh, portfolio analysis and realizing that, you know, when you take a stock off and you think you're getting rid of a lot more beta, uh, are you really getting rid of a lot more beta? Systems that can help you analyze that on a real-time basis. And I think those are the kind of things that help us uh, try and not confront the same issues as far as asset allocation and that correlation between different asset classes. Ray, you know, one of the things we talked about pr prior to the panel was the, you know, s sometimes it's hard as someone who's investing funds with sub-managers to get a true sense of what their risk characteristics are. And I'm wondering if, as you think about diversifying your own portfolio, if you're asking new questions of your managers to understand how they play into, again, to make sure you, you're diversified in the way you need to be. Uh, has that changed? Uh, it's changed uh, to an extent. I mean, at the same time, it's your ability to, to do something about it becomes the, the greater challenge, uh, especially when you're dealing with illiquid investments. You, you're aware that there, you know, there are certain risks inherent with those investments, but how do, you, how do you do anything about it when you're locked in for five years? I mean, that's the case where you're starting to take in uh, different models and different factors to then affect your liquid portfolio. And I think that's one of the, the areas that we've focused on is how to maintain that liquidity and really keep liquid assets that you can get to. As opposed to the past, you might have relied upon your hedge fund portfolio or certain other assets that you could quickly liquefy if you need to, and then you discovered that these weren't just, you know, 30-year treasuries. These were off the runs or you had problem, you know, getting liquidity. So I think that's what a lot of organizations have dealt or is focused on is how to maintain liquidity 
for a, a funding cycle that gives you enough comfort to work through a, to work through a crisis, and that crisis could be you know six months. Um, mm -hmm. We kept a large uh, allocation of cash for for a long period. We still do, uh, and I think that's also to be tactical as well. So it's not only for a a crisis, but it's also if an opportunity comes along, which, for example, I know Sebastian pointed out when the converts market sort of became problematic for hedge funds, we were one of the organizations that were buying those convertibles. So at times when you are looking for that, uh, you know, some folks might say that's a cash drag. Well, it also gives you that comfort that if you have a problem, you have safety. But at the same time, if a tactical opportunity comes along, you can implement it. Right. You know, Andrew, so can I just? Yeah, go ahead. I think that's an important element because I mean, you know, we had a difficult time. But when we went through back out to the market and we saw, you know, there was clearly a, a trade to be made there, we set up an opportunistic fund for our investors to just capture uh, that, uh, that ability in the market. And we made a, a, a great return and we returned the capital. And I think that's an element looking towards the future that we try and accomplish. And that's, you know, creating specific vehicles for investors to capture opportunities that we see in the market. We've just come to market and closed a, a fund. We raised a billion one in a, in a senior loan, mid, uh, lending to mid-sized companies in this country, private loans. Uh, we think it's one of the last credit opportunities left in the, in the marketplace. Again, a specific, but we raised it in the right kind of fund, private equity-like uh, terms, uh, drawdown over the next uh, two years as we do each loan. And I think that there's opportunity set to be captured going forward uh, in, in, uh, in the markets, but you have to be opportunistic and, yeah. and build the right vehicles for it.